Um, thanks a lot for having us, guys. Really means a lot to us to be able to come and share our experience with you. Um, collectively, we are John Radcliffe Studio, um, design practice where we do photography, graphic design, and video work. Um, my name's Daniel Castro Garcia. Um, I've been photographing for about 10 years. I studied Spanish and Latin American literature at UCL. Um, and when I graduated, I went into the film industry um, and I now work as an assistant director on commercials and music videos. But in all of that time, I've always had a, a passion for photography and it's very much something that you can do on your own in your spare time. Um, and prior to this book, I'd sort of always worked on personal projects such as this one, which was a series of uh, portraits that I took in Amsterdam over a six week period. Um, called Beast Have Mercy and I've kind of always been interested in people that kind of have some sort of outsider quality to them or marginalised ethnic communities um, and yeah um, and I studied graphic design at Camberwell in London and after that I did an MA in humanitarian design in Eindhoven in Holland in the Design Academy Eindhoven um, and then I did an internship at a design studio called Hort in Germany. Um, I did a scholarship in Italy for Fabrica, which is uh, a research institute that has photography, graphic, product, various design departments, and that's funded by United Colors of Benetton. And I'd recommend it, really. I'd recommend anyone. I think you have to be under 25 to apply there, um, but it's a really, a really good year scholarship they give you somewhere to live they pay you a wage they pay you food every day and you kind of got all the resources you want to to do creative projects which is directed by them um so i sort of did those various things in europe came back to london was working as a graphic designer for a couple of years but reached the point where i wanted to be a bit more in control of the kind of work i was doing and essentially sort of work for myself and having known Danny since we were kids, since we were born essentially, which is why we say it was founded 1985, <laughs> um, it, it made uh, an obvious choice to start to work together and that's what we've been doing um, for the past year, year and a half. So <clears throat> Over the last couple of years, there's obviously been quite a lot of news regarding uh, migration of people from Africa into Europe um, and with the Syrian conflict and Middle Eastern conflicts, uh, a lot of people have been moving from Turkey through Greece into Europe and in April last year, over the course of one, one week, two uh, boats with combined over a thousand people capsized in the Mediterranean and these people lost their lives and uh, this led to some really unsavory media, media reaction um, which we'll go into in a second but we felt that there was a bigger story to tell here than statistics and tabloid headlines so we really started to think about uh, how we could perhaps address this story and what we could do in terms of approaching it using photography as a, as a tool for that. So I mean, when Danny initially suggested the project to me, we, we basically wanted to find out who the people were that were making these trips. It was an, an incredible news story of, of these overcrowded boats Get headed towards Lampedusa with those two incidents, which is a tiny Italian fishing village. So it was this weird, incongruous sort of collision of worlds where where this provincial little village was getting um, sort of inundated by people fleeing um, from Africa so we were fascinated by the story but at the same time like I said really wanted to meet the individuals there and this is a, a Google image search migrants Europe and it just sort of sums up the kind of imagery that was generally being used to tell the story which as you can see there are a lot of kind of faceless crowds essentially um, and there's a, a general emotion of, of panic, fear, chaos an intimidating kind of atmosphere to the imagery 
and we essentially yeah w- wanted to wanted to meet individuals and and meet people on a personal level so that that kind of is what motivated the ideas for essentially Danny having just done that portrait series which you saw in Amsterdam we wanted to have that same treatment to this group of people and and document them in the same way so one of the things that over the last year and a half that has really concerned us is the way that images of these sort of highly sensitive situations then get taken on and used to have sort of political impact in our society. Um, Some of you may be aware of this poster that was released by uh, Nigel Farage um, during the Brexit campaign and this image was taken by uh, Jeff Mitchell, a Getty photographer um, on the Croatian-Slovenian border where people would um, had to walk for eight kilometers from the train station in Croatia across the border into Slovenia and they were kettled by Croatian and Slovenian military to walk in this manner through you know abandoned villages tiny little villages through the countryside and you know the reality of the message of of this poster is is almost like a complete farce really because the people in this image are fleeing war you know it's not difficult to have a look online it's in the news every single day what people are enduring in Syria and there's something tremendously arrogant about you know a British you know individual or organization using an image such as this to induce threat and fear in our society when who knows you know we could face exactly the same problems one day in our lives and we all need to be received and treated hopefully in a better way than these people were treated. Researching this image, we kind of stumbled upon some interesting sort of coincidences. Um, Where this is from uh, a documentary called Auschwitz... uh, The Nazis and the Final Solution. Nazis and the Final Solution. Um, And this is documentary footage of post-First World War Um, Jewish communities uh, moving towards Germany and you can see the kind of language that was being used to incite hatred in the German people. Um, You know, incredibly vulnerable societies getting compared to parasites and, you know, creating this general feeling of of negativity towards people that, you know, at the end of the day, just just the same as us. So um, that was just something that we thought was really interesting to sort of think about and for us to kind of analyse a little bit. Um, So yeah, these were the kind of uh, front pages that we were seeing, the way the story was being handled, the language that was being used, and it just felt at odds with our personal reaction to what was happening, and we didn't feel represented by this stuff. So we wanted to go for ourselves, find out for ourselves, and and document it, communicate the story in our own way because we felt so at odds with what was happening in the newspapers. Um, you know, I think you know this is a typical kind of photo that f- that fits that format, that medium of the newspaper. Something has to be happening. There's an event. It's an action shot, um, and essentially. Uh, again the emotional kind of connotations are are fear there's an idea of being attacked and we wanted to take the same people and just take portraits that were a lot more honest and and just um calmer and a a different end of uh, emotional spectrum because that's just the way that we personally would want to engage with with the people that we would go and meet so um this is a kind of map covering the different locations that we visited uh, over a five-month period. Um, our first trip was the Red Line, um, where we went to Lampedusa and then to Catania in Sicily. Um, the second trip, um, I started out with um, our producer Jade Morris, um, which was a road trip to Calais, to Milan, Slovenia, Croatia. Belgrade and Serbia, down to Macedonia, 
all the way to Athens where we took a ferry to Lesbos from there back up to well back to Athens and then across to uh, it Sicily again because we wanted to catch up with people that we'd met in the summer up to Pescara to catch up with one of the guys that we'd met in the summer in Sicily that had been transferred then up to Vienna and from Vienna to Germany where I managed to stay in contact with some of the people that I'd met in Greece and Macedonia and I wanted to see where they were now to then end up in Calais. I did a subsequent two, three other trips to Calais for week periods and the final trip was I believe in April, was it April? I think April where I went to Idomeni on the northern coast, on the north of, uh, in the north of Greece on the border with Macedonia um, which is a tiny village which had uh, 154 people in a 2011 census and earlier this year had 13,000 people living in fields that were trapped there. I think it's worth saying as well that in the initial instance it was a totally personal self-funded thing but that just involved paying for the flight to go to Lampedusa and bring our camera and some film but that was all the kind of infrastructure that was necessary. No one had asked us to go or pe paid for us to go, but we just, but I think it's kind of important to underline how anybody who can afford a flight to somewhere can go and photograph it. Once we were there, you were, you didn't necessarily need a press pass to go into certain places. And um, there were second, once we had that first bunch of photos from the first trip, we then off the back of that got some funding to make the second trip but um, th the initial impetus of it all started just completely independently and I think that's kind of important to say that you don't need necessarily people behind you You're, you just with your own curiosity can go wherever you want and, and start taking pictures so during that second big road trip um, Bruno Bailey the editor of Vice magazine um, nominated me to enter the first book award for Mac and me and Tom took this as a real opportunity to do something interesting with the work like as a photographer I think you always want to see your work on paper or at least personally that's sort of the ultimate goal in a way um, you spend so much time in front of your computer sifting through images the idea of a book is like really motivating and kind of the you know exactly where you want your work to be I think so um, we made the short list and uh, after that she'll yeah made short list. oh well yeah there was one one point I sort of wanted to make and like a personal concern with image making nowadays is the sort of lifespan of images so you know you have Instagram and Facebook where you know, you'll consume an image for a second, two seconds, five seconds, on to the next one. Newspaper, it's a day. Magazines can be a week or a month. But a book, I think, sort of has an almost archival, historical value to it. And with this, the sort of themes that we were exploring, it was quite a sort of motivation to also try and create something that could, you know, there would be a thousand copies of something that could, you know, stand the test of time so to speak and offer a really valuable historical you know context for the work and it just doesn't get lost in that online world um, yeah yeah um, so this this is a scan of Danny's Spanish passport as you can see it's got illustrations of butterflies and in the t bottom corners here it's actually got maps of the migration of these animals um, and this is just illustrating the point that the passport was our first thought when thinking about how to to package the photographs in this story and I guess it's, it's an obvious link to make because passports are these documents that people have designed to facilitate and record movement between borders so they're automatically symbols of nationality identity <coughs> frontiers and it was all of these issues that were completely tied to to the topic that we were photographing so it was straight away um, a reference point for the design of the book and, and then we started to look into the, the typography in there and we just mirrored that in the book 
and the maps that you saw in the previous one for example made us think about putting maps into into our book to give a geographical context but also just as sort of an illustrative element um, we also looked at the British passport it's got um, the, the thread that, that binds it down the middle is red white and blue and so we took a little inspiration from that and made the, the tape that that binds the spine of this book blue for Europe and we basically looked at passports in, in some detail and, and got a lot of inspiration from them for the, the for the design of the book which this is the dummy copy there that we ended up submitting so we and um, put our dummy into the competition and before the winner got announced we got called in by Michael Mack for a meeting and he essentially told us that we came very close to winning the competition but we didn't because essentially the book didn't fit into to Max catalog and their 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 body of books that they've they've previously published and this was slightly outside of that but Michael became essentially a huge patron of the project and told us that we needed to self publish it um, and he said we should do a Kickstarter and he started mentioning names like Martin Parr oh I'll send it to Martin he'll have a look we'll get the money don't worry <laughs> and we were just completely blown away by by this dropping names like that and essentially him telling us that he re really liked the book so it was it was really awesome news to hear and he very uh, kindly coached us through the whole process really because neither of us had made a a book on on this scale I've been involved in print projects before in graphic design but not something this big and so the day of the meeting he got one of his um, employees to talk us through creating the spec sheet choosing the materials um, which printers to contact and that same day he was saying like you need to send this to those printers now because he set us a deadline of May 18th he said if you can get this published for May I'll launch it at Photo London for you guys um, which was six weeks away and we actually find, find, end up finding out that the printer needed four weeks to make the book and then Danny wanted to do one more trip to Greece to bring the kind of imagery up to date so we had sort of two weeks where Danny made that last trip came back scan all the images retouch all of those images put them into the document do our you know re final tweaks from the dummy to the final version get it sent off and then get the final books sent back we had to get like an advance of 100 or 200 copies for photo london so it was all kind of seat of the pants stuff and we en ended up making decisions at the printers we used the printer in um in belgium and we go over there and you you sit and you you see the the test prints come out and you tell them how you want the colors changed and they'll tweak the machines and print out another set for you to look at and they had a little apartment in the factory that we slept over and Danny was up all night checking each kind of section of the book as it comes out but even then they were bringing us stuff and we were looking at the kind of the potential cover and we had to decide like then how it was going to be done because we just didn't have time whereas it, it would have been great to have more time to make these decisions more carefully but at the same time it was great to do it so quickly and to get it out there because it was sort of um, you know a hot relevant topic so we did the Kickstarter which was also a massive effort of emailing and contacting every single person that you've ever met and asking them for money which is a difficult thing to have to do you test a lot of friendships and <laughs> <laughs> they think, thankfully Michael Mack and his network and the newsletter from Mack is essentially what got it over the line we got a good chunk of the way there just through our personal contacts but he eventually managed to, to get it through so we got the money and got it all printed in time which was, um, which was hair raising and stressful and a lot of work I, I, I had hair before <laughs> this so yeah kind of yeah yeah so this is what we ended up making, um, like in the original dummy, the fonts and everything on the front were white, so we got the opportunity to get them in gold and really sort of get across that idea of the passport. And we also thought for you know quite a chunk of the production, we ended up wrapping them 
in survival blankets, which are the same blankets that were used by individuals all throughout Europe. You may have seen images from the Balkans of children, men, women, all wrapped up in these gold foil blankets. And for us, it was quite interesting also to set this idea up of, you know, you're wrapping something in gold and subsequently making it quite precious. Um, and, you know, almost looks like a delicious chocolate bar. And that kind of juxtaposition of, well, this is such a heavy subject matter, why can't it be sort of treated with a little bit of beauty too? It doesn't have to be all <coughs> negative and, and heavy. Let's, you know, try and introduce these other sort of design ideas to also make it a bit more of a textural experience as you're going through the book and interacting with the book. Um, yeah. So this is how we structured the book. And um, it essentially is interesting because you've got a journey through the book itself, but we're documenting journeys that people are making as well. So that created quite a lot of interesting parallels. Um, essentially, one element of, of it is chronological. So Lampedusa was the first trip that we made and Idomeni was the last. Um, <coughs> But it's also trying to reflect this idea of the journeys that people are making. So we, the the Lesbos and Catania and Lampedusa are all about kind of the the arriving and the landing of people. The Balkans is where people are kind of moving and journeying through Europe. And then Calais and Idomeni are places that people ended up getting stuck. And you get these these camps that um, spring up and people living in tents and and this people living in limbo. So it had these these um, these journeys from various aspects uh, throughout the book, um, and I think it was the, f the first chapter. Danny's going to talk about Lampedusa as well. Was interesting that it ref also reflects our gradual understanding of the subject matter and our gradual immersion into it. The first chapter, Lampedusa, when we arrived there. Um, like a week before they'd actually changed the laws in Italy to take all rescued boats to Sicily, larger island, more facilities to accommodate people. So we got to Lampedusa or with our camera and it was just no, and no one was there. And we were kind of like, well, I said, well, no, what, the, what are we going to do? And we had to figure out the sort of research side of it and we discovered that people going to Sicily and we eventually followed it but it's quite fitting that our first chapter is quite empty quite sparse because we did arrive not knowing really very much about it at all and gradually as you go through the book you get deeper and deeper and deeper into the topic so basically each chapter sort of starts like this um, we start with text that just sort of offer a context for the images um, we have tracing paper running through the book for the maps um, for each section that we kind of included for a number of reasons. One, because of the passport connotation. Two, to sort of play with this idea that borders are very sort of almost transparent and fluid and, you know, what do they actually mean? And also the ideas of ghostliness. Um, and Lampedusa proved to be like a really, really important chapter for the whole book because like Tom said we arrived there and there were no people and you know you're going there expecting to be able to interact with people and there's no one to photograph so what this resulted in was actually the most valuable experience where we started the project considering the aftermath of this movement of people um, so in the centre of the island there's a port where they have five harboured boats which were used for these uh, for the journeys from North Africa to, to Italy and they're sort of there to serve as a kind of monument to all of those that had lost their lives and um, it was really interesting to sort of interact with the island almost on a sort of forensic level. We were a bit naughty and broke into a few interesting looking buildings where we discovered piles and piles of clothes and fires where when Lampedusa had received such a high number of people that they started escaping from the centre they would come into these abandoned buildings and, and 
sleep effectively and hide and we found loads of abandoned clothing which we documented individually and then maybe the, I didn't, we feel a bit conflicted about this image but we thought it'd be curious to make an installation out of the clothing in this abandoned swimming pool complex um, just you know create a slightly more poetic element to the work second chapters in Lesbos so people leaving Turkey coming to Greece and this is again a really really important chapter on a personal level because there was such a heavy presence of media um, you know you'd be on a beach with five or six boats arriving at the same time with up to 60 people on board and all of a sudden there would just be a pack of photographers and news agencies running from one boat to the next and the reason that some of these book th these images are in black and white is because I feel they sort of tap into a more traditional photojournalistic approach to image making um, these are digital photographs all of the other photos in the book are medium format film which I think straight away encourages a completely dis different discipline to the way you approach photography you have to be slower you have to think about what you want you have ten photographs to your roll of film whereas with digital you snap 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 and on a personal level as a photographer you know the challenge of working with medium format was to actually take the time to really think about what I wanted to achieve from the images obviously here you're really getting into the thick of the action and there was a feeling of wanting to compete like the image on the right for example um, I remember feeling slightly disappointed with myself in a way where you know I can maybe appreciate the sort of beauty and the power of the image where I had kind of asked permission to take the image in whatever way I could all of a sudden a few minutes later I've got 15 photographers around me with a you know big Canon 5D's sort of firing very violently there was like a violence to the act and to taking those images and I feel for example this image I'm much more comfortable with and much more proud of and I really feel that it tells exactly the same story in a much more dignified way there's a boat arriving other refugees watching it arrive tells exactly the same story but without having to get right in the thick of it and sort of not ask for permission and, and you know people are dealing with grief the first thing that they get when they arrive on land isn't you know they don't necessarily want a massive camera in their face there are also landscapes running through the book which I feel also tap into the idea of creating a geograph geographical context for the work but also an idea of serenity and peace and calm um, yeah Sicily is probably the backbone of this project and it's where we developed our strongest relationships again it's like a front line to this uh, movement of people entering Europe this image was taken on the port of Catania um, and as you might notice everyone's wearing white socks most people that arrive from Africa end up losing pretty much everything they have in these boat journeys and in contrast to Lesbos which is complete chaos and really badly organized no NGOs very little government presence in Italy they do things a lot more uh, in a much more civil way people land they're photographed they're given water they're seen to by doctors and then they're processed where their names are taken and they can get taken to different reception centers this image and the next image kind of triggered a real personal curiosity into the sort of psychological impact of these journeys that people face if you notice in this image and here everyone's completely packed together and that's exactly this, the same way people have sort of been for the last probably two to three months of their lives in smuggler houses on board the vessels and they land in Europe and there's space for them to move and there's this real you know you can really sense fear and and 
uncertainty and people all kind of stay together and I, for future work I think this is something that I would I would really like to look into a bit more so just some portraits taken at the port at this nighttime landing and then in Catania itself there's an unbelievable sort of African community Senegalese Gambian Nigerian communities all sort of thriving and really lively and interesting and it was kind of really beautiful to walk around the city and approach people and start to develop relationships and understand more about what their lives are like in actually in Europe people that have been here for a year two three years this is a car park an abandoned car park in the center of the city which um, during the summer was used as a sort of makeshift resting point overnight where basically when people arrive they are kind of more or less forced to put their fingerprints into a system so they can be registered as having been a, a arrived in Italy and if they do that they end up getting stuck in the Italian sort of bureaucratic system of refugee processing which can take anywhere from six months apparently to three or four years before people are given work permits so you end up with certain communities, particularly Eritreans and Sudanese, which refuse to give their fingerprints because they want to continue their journeys through Italy to get to France, hoping to get either to Sweden or the UK. Uh, this was a young boy called Zacharias, who was 19. Um, he'd left Eritrea two years previously, uh, was kidnapped in Libya, spent three weeks trapped inside a cell with 150 people and uh, and crossed the Sahara Desert on a pickup truck convoy uh, met him was really quite a remarkable guy Eritrean Christians that were fleeing persecution they were really proud to be able to wear their crosses which I thought was really quite heartwarming really and about an hour away from Catania is a camp called Mineo where guys that do give their fingerprints get taken and, and they're told to wait effectively just wait until we summon you for your meeting then we'll give you your documents but some of these guys have been there for two years so it's effectively like a jail they're not really allowed to leave they can leave for one night but if they go missing for more than one night then they lose their place in the camp and they're on their own guy on the left is Musa, guy on the right is Omar um, we both met them um, and uh, when I went back in November Omar was still in the camp and Musa had been transferred to Piscara which is a city about an hour away from Rome I think it's important to mention like if you go back to that last one like sometimes people are asking you was it, was it harrowing, was it difficult seeing this stuff I mean these people did not get you down did you how did you deal with it because actually the strongest memories are the really positive interactions like with these two guys we had a really really nice afternoon getting to know them joking talking about what football team they supported whatever it was and you know maybe you don't get that from these images but like they were just really fun positive people to have met and we you know ended up forming quite good friendships with these people. Yeah, like M Musa and Omar, you know, sort of speak to still on a regular basis and it's really quite difficult to, for example, with Musa on the right, having met him in the summer where he was really vibrant, upbeat, happy character and then meeting him again in November and, you know, his skin was really bad, like he like wasn't eating properly, like the the time of the weight and everything was already taking such a massive toll on his life and it was just kind of <coughs> quite, quite difficult to to sort of record that in a way because you kind of hope that now you know people get to Europe their lives are going to improve but actually they're kind of getting worse um, and, a, and a lot of people would you know sort of say that if I could do this again I would never have come because this is a you know this is a nightmare this is probably the most sort of special relationship that's formed out of the project. This is Ali, he's uh, 26 years old, who left Senegal six years ago. And he's been living in Catania for three and a half years. 
he still does not have a work permit so effectively it's real hand-to-mouth existence selling fake trainers in the market um, the image on the left was taken in the summer the image on the right was winter um, and you know throughout the book we have these diptychs where we've revisited people and I think that's quite an in integral part of the project too this idea that you stay in touch with people and you form that relationship with them and you can see a real development in their situation I kind of love these because it's you know that exact same look in his eye six months later was quite a happy coincidence with Ali we sort of had the opportunity to think more about what were the themes in his life that most affected him and this one I think you know quite clearly sort of looks at the ideas of time slipping through his fingers um, and again like one of the reasons we sort of want to work in this way is that it's an image that's telling the same story but in a much more poetic and gentle way and, and an intimate way too this is Madia, um, also Senegalese. Um, this is an image which we sort of created and sort of dedicated to his best friend Sana, who he travelled with from Senegal. Um, Sana, unfortunately, was murdered in Libya by the people traffickers. Um, they shot him in the head directly in front of Madia. So not only do you know people arrive to Europe having to endure a horrendous experience in the Mediterranean Ocean but there's the horrifying journey across the Sahara Desert where you know 30 men are on the back of a pickup truck holding onto a stick as vehicles you know plow over dunes and if they fall off then they're just left in the desert in Libya you get held in people trafficking houses um, not really allowed to leave um, so you know he he had to go through such a you know traumatic thing of, of seeing this murder um, having to find a way of you know kind of putting the body to rest in the most humane way he could and then when he arrived to Italy was accused of being the captain of a ship so spent four months in uh, the jail in Catania without being charged and uh, not being guilty for a crime when he left the jail, he walked into the town and, uh, and met Gucci, which is how we then met Madia. Um, but I think, you know, as our relationship developed, we wanted to explore ways in which we could create an image that was about witnessing and that would allow him to express himself and, you know, let him have his own identity in an image. It wasn't just about you know, me as a photographer, I'm going to come along and take your portrait and yeah, you know, you've told me the story but to actually make this something where, where we can interact together and develop ideas together and work on these ideas of self-representation and going back to the ideas in Lesbos of, you know, press photographers coming in and quite violently sort of taking images, I think there's this idea of like stealing grief, you know, and and I think with an image like this, we sort of want, you know, wanted to share it with him. Then in the Balkans, um, these images are taken in Slovenia, where um, trains had arrived from Croatia with about one and a half thousand people on board. Uh, when people arrive, they're then taken into a registration centre and moved into um, an area called No Man's Land, which is literally a cordoned off car park with three toilets where all of these people were forced to wait um, from nine o'clock in the morning until eleven o'clock at night in zero degrees women children and elderly disabled um, this was taken at approximately five o'clock in the afternoon um, people had not been given any water any food in this time and uh, this is when they just decided to bring everybody a slice of bread each and one small bottle of water. Um, some of the people complained about feeling really unwell. Uh, one guy had an epileptic fit which lasted for about 40 minutes. No ambulance came, just had to get through it. Um, and one thing that I think is really kind of was shocking about the Balkans is that 
obviously the fall of Yugoslavia was not that long ago and it kind of really feels like history was repeating itself in a way in that part of the world. Um, at night time I sort of decided to break into that cordoned off area and uh, sort of to my horror walking through this field um, I discovered that there were families sat around fires with massive piles of whatever clothing they had um, and I approached this family and uh, the father sort of said in whatever English he could look 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 and took off a few items of clothing off of this pile and there was a newborn baby right in the middle of it that had blue lips you know that really wasn't far off death and uh, speaking to an Austrian reporter that I met there um, who had done more work on the Austrian side of the Slovenian border he said that there were periods of time in which the Austrian authorities and the Slovenian authorities would kind of make the conditions as difficult as possible so that if deaths occurred they could you know reach out to the European Union and try and get more funding or more you know infrastructural support or whatever it was they needed the irony for me was that the Austrian camp held about 4,000 people where people could sleep and on this day they only had a thousand people in it so if they'd have just decided to let people through and start processing them scenes like this would never have happened guys would climb trees to rip branches to make little fires to try and stay warm so kind of what was important for me also was this idea of having a forensic quality to the work this is a guy called Abdul Rahman who's from Syria and he was shot by an Assad regime sniper um, through his back whilst driving um, he was now living as a refugee in Vienna I was lucky enough to meet him, spent a day with him and his friends that he shared the apartment with um, and it was just kind of really very intense to sort of hear his story and you know his journey through Europe with these terrible injuries like shrapnel wounds to his legs and you know he'd lost his family out there then there's also some kind of images that I think again like Gucci they're about going back and revisiting people the image on the left this girl is called Kimia she's a 12 year old Iranian girl image on the left was taken in Lesbos the day that she arrived um, I managed to sort of make enough of a connection with her mother exchanged numbers and said look I'd like to come find you guys again so once I'd gone to Italy I decided to go up to Berlin to go and meet them where I thought it would be quite an interesting idea to take an, a photograph of her by the Berlin Wall Memorial and play with this idea of an old and new Europe you had a point you wanted to make. Well, I think it's just interesting the importance or significance of the Berlin Wall being this sort of monument now to to division and separation from the 80s, that other world where these yeah two different ideologies were were physically separated, and to go back there is is and address the sort of the modern issues of of borders and separation and. <coughs> Um, yeah, barriers between cultures. So the penultimate chapter is about Calais, which I'm sure many of you may know is a sort of refugee migrant camp in the north of France, which now has about 10,000 people. They're always threatening to shut it down. Uh, never seems to happen. Um, people kind of living in tents. Like what was really amazing about Calais is where more and more people would arrive the infrastructure of the place changed unbelievably quickly so the first times we went it was like ripped tents which would then evolve into wooden shacks which then evolved into metal containers so there was like this amazing sort of architectural development to the place which I thought was quite fascinating um, the heart like the hub of this chapter is all kind of portraiture unaccompanied miners um, loads of people in the camp walk around with their heads covered up not to look scary but more because they're scared that if they get identified in the camp that it will affect their asylum process in the UK which I've been 
told as a myth. But anyway, it was really quite interesting to also sort of take an image like the one on the right where, you know, a lot of people might think that it's quite frightening, but the person that's frightened is that individual. Faith was a really interesting thing to observe on this journey and you know the way Islam has sort of been damned by many sections of the media and society and this is Abraham who really kindly let me document his prayer ritual and sort of in my experience on this trip religion was like a fundamental tool that people had to kind of carry on to survive you know and I really kind of admire Abraham for you know being in these kind of conditions but still practicing his faith you know every day committed to it gives him his strength and yeah I, I think it's, it's quite a, you know quite a beautiful image this one. It's refreshing like Islam doesn't have to be represented in that extremist violent way like we, we saw this just this very peaceful sort of strength giving side mm. to it. Mm guys praying in the camp and like I think there was also it was quite important to sort of get images of sort of everyday life um, in sort of North African culture grooming is like a really important aspect so it was kind of really bizarre walking around bumping into these two guys threading their eyebrows you know it was like wow kind of weird This is another kind of one of my sort of favourite stories. Um, the image in, on the left was taken in the car park in Catania, where I told you about Zacharias and the Eritrean Christians. He was actually travelling with um, Zacharias, and usually what I found is that people would kind of make sort of have makeshift family units, um, and Medani. Um, ended up in Calais and on my last day in Calais at the end of my second trip I sort of turned around and there he was like we hadn't had any contact over the course of six months and we just sort of found each other there by complete coincidence and that was really like a really beautiful moment for us both there's also like really really worrying aspects of life in the camp in Calais um, last year Approximately 25 to 30 people were killed in hit-and-run accidents trying to get onto cars or the trains. Um, this was a, a young Sudanese man called Youssef that had been killed in a hit-and-run. Um, and this is the way they sort of advertised or communicated uh, his death around the jungle camp. Um, and the, you know, the driver of this vehicle was never caught, so it's just this young man has come from the other side of the world to end up dying on a motorway in France and there isn't any justice for him even then. Um, but in his honour there was a protest and a vigil um, and you know these are the kind of signs that people were holding. There was like a real element of frustration at the conditions that people were living in and enduring. You want to say anything about this? Um, but it was kind of really curious that we were probably the only sort of a group of five or six photographers documenting this and what was really kind of challenging was that as the, all of these people wanted to sort of leave the camp to get into Calais to do their protest in the town they were met by massive line of police officers um, which I have to say in Calais are extremely intense and very violent very violent people. These are images taken from the kind of demolition of the camp or part of the southern southern part of the camp I uh, believe in February, March, excuse me having a mind, mind blank there um, but basically people were evicted by force and then um, many, group, many people uh, sort of pissed off at having to leave to God knows where would just set fire to their tents as you can see, you know, the image on the right is of a Syrian refugee. Um, image on the left is the police force in Calais. You know, 
incredibly armed and uh, you know more than ready to use force if necessary. Then the final chapter of the book was taken in Idomeni, which is this small town on the n in the north of Greece on the border with Macedonia. And I think um, what happened here was really kind of the most troubling part of the whole journey. Like I said before, it was a town of 100 people that became sort of 11 to 13,000 and people were just trapped there. Um, there were no official showers. Um, over 50% of the people there were uh, children, loads of women, births taking place in the camp, nowhere for women to wash, outbreaks of diarrhea, um, head lice, like loads of, the, loads of the children had shaved heads um, to try and solve the issue, incredibly inhumane conditions, they were all sort of farmyard barns where people were sleeping. Um, surrounded by feces, children sort of sleeping in fields, you know, really quite scandalous to be honest. It's an 85 year old lady, um, they're both called Sarah, she's actually the grandmother on the, of the girl on the left, kind of bizarre they should both be sharing this experience. Again, sort of forensic, slightly more forensic images. Um, the image on the right might be a bit hard to see, but that little baby's got a burnt arm um, from Assad regime bombing. And then again, like the landscapes, there are some still lives in the book, just to sort of break up the portraiture and try and create a slightly different visual uh, impact in the book. Is there anything you want to say about the still lives? Um, I don't know, I guess it's, it's putting that kind of abstract abstract artistic element in there to, to just change the tone of it and, and to have, a, a, like you say, the landscapes to have a, a calmer feel um, and to yeah, give a, a break from all the all the faces, I guess. Yeah. There are some moments of you know laughter and things. It's not all terribly intense, or it can be. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was like I thought was really curious. Um, outside the camp, there were sort of some abandoned shacks um, where we found this graffiti, and it was quite you know difficult to imagine that really you know this is kind of what people probably dream about you know the nightmarish imagery um, and we kind of sort of end the chapter on Idomeni with that and yeah that's it I mean this is the last that photo there's the last image in the book um, it's the only one that is more kind of staged than the others we it was the outcome of, uh, of a lot of chats with Gucci ab about his life um, and about what was important to him, we're talking about um, his family. That's kind of what the roses represent, um, is his family's connection to his people back home. You know, that's a, a big reason why he was still kind of going and that's what kind of kept him going as well. And um, you know, D Danny found this, this robe and we were trying to sort of elevate him because he had that inside of him talking to him. He was very kind of s strong determined, inspirational kind of person. And that's a, a, a tone we wanted to end the book with. And it's also, you know, just the side that we really wanted to bring out of people because they had that in them as well. So that was definitely the, the note we wanted to end on. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's it. it. That's it. <laughs>